Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We're working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Dominion Energy, ticker D. Over the next few minutes, I'll discuss my thoughts on both the valuation of this company and its business quality. This company has a market cap of $57 billion, enterprise value of $93 billion. So you can see a significant amount of net debt on this business, about $36 billion based on my quick math. This is a utility company, so it's not super surprising. Utilities be, tend to be operated on a very leveraged basis, but that is, that is a significant amount of leverage um, on this business. <laughs> you can see that they produce and distribute energy in the United States. They have four segments, Virginia, gas distribution, energy, South Carolina, and contracted assets. Um, Virginia transmits and distributes regulated electricity, 2.7 million households. Um, in Virginia, North Carolina. Gas distribution is regulated. That's an important word here, regulated natural gas sales. Um, Ohio, West Virginia, North Carolina, Utah, Idaho, 3.1 million people. So the South Carolina energy is electricity to 772,000 customers and distributing natural gas to 419. And contracted assets is the non-regulated portion of their generation system, electric generation, solar generation, gas transport, LNG. So pretty diversified between electricity and natural gas, um, primarily generating capacity, some distribution lines as well. Um, gives you a pretty good idea. Now, one thing that's pretty common with utility companies that I tend to see in high quality companies is a beta of 0 0.42. The lower the beta, the higher um, the quality of the business tends to be because it's less volatile. The, the less volatility you have in the stock tends to mean less volatile in the results. However, the thing that makes utility companies a little less quality is their return on invested capital tends to be low. And that's what you see here. So this 5% line is showing you that most of the time, certainly over the last decade, they're earning 5% or less on their returns. The last time that they earned more than 5% was 2010. <coughs> and never in the last 20 years have they earned more than 10% return on invested capital. My ten, my threshold that I tend to like to have before I invest in a company is I want every year to be above a 10% return on invested capital, but certainly I want the average to be above a 10% return on invested capital. And we can see over a 20 year period, they've never hit that mark. Now, I do like to see 20 straight years of profitability. Here they have 19 out of 20 of profitable, which is a good sign. Um, they lost money in 2020. Now again, that was COVID, so it complicates everything. There could even be a write down causing that versus normal operations. Um, but But your numbers are all over the place here all over the place. Um, it's, it seems cyclical, so they're probably being driven by some maybe natural gas prices. Um, but they, they clearly have exposure to cyclicality, commodity prices, and that makes it very unstable. I don't like that for business. This tends to be a sign of a lower quality business. Also, the fact that you're, you're basically hugging 5% lower means that you're going to need leverage in order to get a good return on equity. And that is what we see here. Your 10-year median returns, 4.2% return on invested capital, but they do pull off a 12% return on equity. Now, 12% is not the best. I like to see 15%, but 12% is higher than 10%, and 12% is high enough where you could justify an investment in the company. The problem is, is that you are highly dependent upon leverage and the cost of that leverage. When interest rates are low, this works out really, really well. When interest rates are high, this can be devastating. Because as soon as interest rates go above your return on invested capital, then basically all returns for the business go to debt holders and not shareholders. As a shareholder, that becomes a problem. Now, if you're owning the debt, then that's okay. Um, but as a shareholder, we have a massive problem here that you're leveraged to interest rates in a bad way. Um, so I don't like seeing that. The other problem here is you have a price to earnings ratio of 25. This is a high price to pay for high quality companies that are growing. What we have here is it looks like it's a low quality company that's not growing. Your revenue growth is 0%. The, basically the revenue is flat over the last decade. You start at 12.8 billion, you end at 13.9 billion. So there's some growth here, but it's not a lot. <laughs> Meanwhile, your assets have grown by 8% a year. Your EPS is growing at 5% a year. So EPS growing at 5% a year is, is really what matters. You like your EPS growing. Um, but your assets are growing much faster than your revenue and your earnings per share. And that's why your return on invested capital is low. Now, this is driven a lot by regulated markets that you're in. It's going to be hard to earn your returns on invested capital because of that. But it's why your returns end up worse a decade later.
is because you're getting these poor returns on assets. Now, what's interesting here is your gross profit has gone up four and a half billion, six point seven billion. Operating profit is barely up two point eight billion to three point three billion, and your earnings per share appears to be up. But I think there's something weird with these numbers. Um, we're gonna have to look at that. <laughs> I don't trust these numbers. But if you're enjoying this video so far, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Ring the bell so you can get notified as I upload new videos each and every week. And at the end of the video, I will have a link to the past S&P 500 videos that I have covered. I've already covered over 140 S&P 500 companies. And I think you'll enjoy checking those out. So let's look at the income statement. <laughs> this is what I thought. So you have some other non-operating income. And it's quite significant. I mean, is it? these numbers jump around all the time. I don't like that they're that significant all the time. Um, I mean, $1.1 billion in non-operating income, $1.3 billion in non-operating losses. I mean, what are they doing? And it's causing all sorts of volatility here. I mean, <coughs> I don't even know that these numbers make any sense because you have operating profit of $4 billion in 2020. You show these losses here, so you have pre-tax income of 1.4 billion, but then what happens with the loss? Why is there a loss here? Something's wrong with this number. Um, you have huge interest expenses, even at low interest rates. Interest rates have been low for 2020-21, and you're paying $1.3 billion in interest expense. So it's a very significant amount of interest expense. Those interest rates triple, bam, you've wiped out all your profit. So you're, you're in a really tenuous situation here. Um, your EPS appears to have grown a lot if you use 2012, but I think for this case, let's use 2020, 2013. And if we look at 2013, we can see that your EPS is negative across the decade. Although you've grown your net income from 1.7 billion to 2.2 billion, you've actually lost earnings per share because your shares outstanding have gone up so much. So you've gone from 580 million shares outstanding to 809 million shares outstanding. Why is this? Well, they've been diluting you in order to grow. You're not able to grow when you have this much poor cash flow problems. And you're going to see that on the cash flow statement if we go ahead to it. Um, <laughs> this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. Look at this investment. $4 billion, $4 billion, $5 billion, $5 billion, $6 billion, $5 billion. Look at the net income. $300 million, $1.7, $1.3, $1.3. 2 billion. There's not a single year where they invest less than they made in their income. They're investing more than their net income every single year. Not only that, they're investing more. They're investing basically the entirety of their cash flow from operations, if not more. Most of the years they're investing more than their cash flow from operations. And they're investing substantially higher than their depreciation, which means the depreciation is understating the future depreciation costs. So what's actually happening with this business is there's no net income generation. There's no money being created here. They're diluting you constantly, constant issuance of stock. They're issuing new debt constantly. And it's basically a weird Ponzi scheme with these cash pays for dividends because you're paying for the dividends from the new debt. If you weren't able to take on new debt, you wouldn't be able to pay your dividends. If you weren't able to issue new stocks, you wouldn't be able to pay dividends. So if the company had to continue all of this investment and they could only do it from cash on hand, they could only do it from cash generated from the balance sheet, then they would not be able to, and they couldn't issue common stock and they couldn't issue debt, they wouldn't be able to pay dividends. You say, oh, well, but they can issue stock and they can issue debt. Sure, but it's it's not a sustainable setup. This is a recipe for disaster and poor future returns. Um, you can do it. You know, there's nothing illegal about it. It's just, man, it's, this is a disaster. So you could easily tell that that's what's happening because you see this dilution happening. You see that the net income has gone up a little bit, but your EPS is down. That tells you everything you need to know about how this business is going to work. I mean, look at this. PP&E has gone from $29 billion to $59 billion. You've doubled your PP&E, and your income is flat. You're going to lose. You can't do that again. You can't do that again. So um, the future is going to be worse than the past for this company, and the past is not great. So I would avoid Dominion Energy. I hope you've enjoyed this 
investing video, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get it uploads as I upload new videos Monday, Wednesday, and Friday each and every week. I think you'll enjoy that content. I have found some really interesting companies in S&P 500, and you should check out the playlist where I've covered the past 140. If you want to do this type of analysis yourself, I encourage you to check out quickfs.net. You can sign up through my affiliate link below. It is the first link in the description, which will let you sign up for a free or a paid account for them. And if you do it through my link, then I can receive a commission for sending them to them. This is the tool I use myself. I don't recommend anything I don't use myself, and I hope you will check it out. Thank you for listening. Until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.